Okay, listen, I love a good biopic, I really do, but it's starting to feel like a lot of these biopics are trying to replace history. You know, trying to just take some liberties with what really happened. Today on the podcast, the complicated politics of making movies about real life people. Let's go. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, I think the best place to start is right here. Reggae is the people music. You know, you're a superstar. I don't know. You hear that trailer. That's a trailer for Bob Marley, One Love, and you say, I want to see that movie. That sounds like a great movie. I want to see a movie about the life of Bob Marley. It is one of the biggest movies of the year so far. The Marley family was heavily involved in making this movie. But something about this biopic keeps eating at me. It's too clean. It's just too clean of an image of Bob Marley. It basically makes him out to be kind of a saint. There's no mention of his, like, I don't know, infidelity, for example. And yet now it stands as the document of Bob's life. This is what I wanted to talk about today. Not the Bob Marley movie, but biopics in general. Are biopics becoming a replacement for history in some ways, especially when the family of the subject is involved? The group chat is here. Nico Stratus is here. Rad Simon Pillay is here. Bilga Ibiri is here. Nico, Rad, Bilga, welcome to the show, everybody. How's it going? Good morning. Hello. Yeah. Hello. 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 Okay. I love, first of all, I love this energy. That sounds delightful. Let's get into it. Uh, Rad, let's, let's do, I don't know, let's maybe set the stage by talking about some some good examples of biopics because, yes, the work of a biopic is to balance historical accuracy with also telling a compelling story in some ways that gets audiences actually in the theaters. So with that in mind, what's a biopic in your opinion that like does those things and does them well? Uh, so for me, the gold standard is Ali. And let me just tell you, by the way, I'm very humble to be saying this in front of Bilga, who has, is like <laughs> the, uh, the, the uh, authority on all films, Michael Mann. But yes. yeah, like, look, so Ali, uh, the Muhammad Ali story starring Will Smith, directed by Michael Mann. This is a movie that we're like, you know, it it really did capture, I think, the spirit of Ali, but also the po- a real portrait of America at the time, that the, the America that he was standing up against. And yeah. of course, you know, we could talk forever about, you know, how Michael Mann, he, he he got the authenticity. He, he kind of got this on the ground look at that moment in civil during civil the civil rights era and stuff. Yeah. He you know he and then he, he, you know he with with the family involved with Muhammad Ali even on set and he still made it a sexy beast of a movie with mm-hmm. that typical Michael Mann style and stuff. But like you know to go further, I think like you know when you, when you compare it to the Bob Marley movie, which kind of brushed aside a lot of his flaws, like this movie on Ali, like that family clearly embraced this portrait that embraced the messiness, the flaws. Like you see his misogyny, you see his naivety, you see yeah. you see activism as a human endeavor that could be messy and misguided at times. And I think I think the knockout punch for that movie is how it the, you know it ends on a note. The big kind of clim- climactic triumphant note of that movie is actually like kind of hardwired with a sort of self defeat. Right. Hmm. Because if you think about that movie, it like builds up towards the rumble in the jungle. Right. Yeah. The, 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 the title fight in, in, in Zaire at the time, I think it was like the Congo. Yes. Uh, and, you know, like so this here's uh, here's a moment where Ali's go. You know, this is the fight that's set up with Don King. Um, this is the moment where Ali is finally like and re- returning to the ring, you know, in, in the motherland, returning to his roots, returning to the ring for his title fight against America, this oppressor. But then Michael Mann lets it be known, but hold on a second, the rumble in the jungle was benefiting this, you know, kleptocrat despot, uh, Joseph Mobutu. Uh, And and so in the end, Ali's big triumphant moment was just serving the same kind of oppressors, the CIA-backed oppressor that he had been fighting with all along. So, you know, can you imagine how many other filmmakers... Would would, me, would, have would the end guts on to that, that note? Yeah. Would embrace how? Oh, even your big win was like, okay, but it was kind of a defeat. I'm glad. First of all, I'm glad you brought in Michael Mann into this because we're going to talk about the Ferrari movie at the end of this. <laughs> we're going to come back to that. And I know you're an apologist for that movie, but hold on to that thought. Uh, now Nico- I got backup. <laughs> <laughs> this time up. We're gonna we're coming. We're coming. Okay, Nico, what's that biopic for you? A biopic that does these things well. I mean, now I kind of want to watch Ali again. Like I just really like sold <laughs> yes. this movie. I haven't watched it in a long time. Yeah. I think with music, you know, for me as a music person, it's really hard because so much like. Part of the artifice of music and like storytellers that, you know, are sort of writing in a very confessional or like, you know, first person narrative in their work. Yeah. It's part of it is like they're selling you the idea of themselves. And so to do a biopic, you sort of have to either like 
remove that that veneer of the self or lean into it and like so i think about walk the line a lot as like a movie i haven't seen in a long That's time the, but johnny, I, cash yeah, the johnny cash movie yeah. uh with joaquin phoenix uh and like and you know like joaquin met with johnny cash before he died and like because yeah. he thought that he wasn't the right person for that because he didn't have the voice he didn't know how to sing he didn't know how to do all these things he sat with johnny cash and sort of learned less about like the truth of the story more like how does he sing how does he talk how does he move like he yeah. he adopts those things and then like within the context of this story you know some of the truths aren't necessarily dead on this happens a lot in musician biopics i remember watching uh the tina turner ike Tur- uh, and ike document uh biopic yeah. what's love got to do with it yeah. uh when i was in grade school and i know that one you know tina turner afterwards was like a lot of the facts in that were wrong but at the time people really liked that movie because mm-hmm. it's an opportunity to see a story about these people that you think you know and sort of like and it raises the question of do we really want to know these people or do we want to know deeper the idea idea of them that they've been selling us all this time. So I, that gets to the larger question of what's the job of the biopic. And I want to come back to that in a moment. But Bilga, maybe for you, I'll, let's go in the opposite direction. What's an example of a biopic that fell short for you? Well, among recent movies, the one that sort of jumps out at me is the is the film Rustin um, about Baird Rustin, the civil rights activist that's on Netflix. Yeah, Coleman you Domingo know, movie. Gonna, yes. Yeah. And Coleman Domingo is fantastic in it. I mean, I believe he's nominated for an Oscar. Mm-hmm. And so he kind of makes the film watchable even better than watchable but Mm -hmm. at the same time the film you know feels like such a data dump when you're watching it i mean it feels like you know it feels like this the filmmakers went into it not with a screenplay but with a checklist of Mm -hmm. just like got to show this got to show this got to show this in fact there's actually one line you know there are a couple of lines that i that i wrote down from the film that i just find fascinating it's like lines like Norm, Tom, meet the indomitable Cleve Robinson, union leader of District 65 and newly appointed chairman of the March's administrative committee. The whole movie is like this. The whole movie is like this. It's all exposition. It's all like, this is who this person is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of like you walk away from the film. Yes, you know something about Baird Rustin, and that's great because he's not a particularly well-known figure sort of in mainstream history. Um, But at the same time, is it like a good movie? Uh, No, no. And, you know, you feel like, well, I should have watched the documentary about it, you know? Right. But but, so what I'm interested in there is that like this fell, fell, fell short as a film. Uh, mm-hmm. But then when we think about, I don't know, like Napoleon, for example, think about the Napoleon that just came oh, out yeah. and like it, a lot of people, I think including you said, hey, this was like a good time. I, this was like a riveting watch. I really enjoyed it. I know that Rad was also an apologist I for Napoleon. I got your back. I got your back. But, but Napoleon was trashed by a lot of historians. Like historians were like, that's not at all what happened. None of this is what happened in Napoleon. And so like there, there was this sort of like attempt to reconcile the job of the biopic with mm-hmm. the job of the movie. And sometimes the job of the movie is to entertain. And the biopic is trying to say, here's at least some real history that happened. How do you think about that, Bilga? Well, in the case of Napoleon, you have to kind of see it in the context of just Napoleon movies. There have been so many of them. That's and each fair. one is trying to do its own it's thing. Its own and of course, yeah. and famously, Stanley Kubrick was trying to make a film about Napoleon for, for many, many years. I mean, his whole career, basically. Yeah. And, you know, that's actually still a project at Warner Brothers. I think they're going to turn it into like a Mac series at some point with like Steven Spielberg producing. So with a movie like Napoleon, you're running into things like well, there are other Napoleon movies. How do we make ours different? Yeah. All right, well, we'll just make it, uh, you know, total trash. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I enjoyed Napoleon. I, as I said at the time, I'm like, I'm still waiting for the director's cut that because that feels like one of those movies where Ridley Scott <laughs> saved the best stuff for the for the director's cut. He tends to do that. Can I also a, add yeah, 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 that, sure. the, that, that director's cut? No, it's on Apple now and it's not the director's cut. And I need to protest Apple. Like, where is the director's <laughs> cut? Like, release this, the, the, the Ridley cut here. Like, what's going on? We need to call Michael Mann and have him pay a visit to Ridley Scott. <laughs> Oh, it's funny about this. Is like Ridley Scott is the one of very few filmmakers that I'm like, hey, can you give me the longer version of the thing you made? Because that's usually yeah. better than the shorter <laughs> one. Nico, we've seen filmmakers push back on this idea that biopics need to be historically accurate, right? Like Viola Davis played the lead in The Woman King, which is about the legendary Dahomey warrior women. And Viola's husband, who's a producer on the movie, his quote was, we have to entertain people. If we just told a history lesson, which we very well could have, that would be a documentary. Uh, that movie was criticized a lot for being like, that's not not really the story of the Dahomies. The Dahomies. What do you make of what he's saying there? The idea that you know what our job here is to entertain. 
I mean, I agree with that ultimately. You know, like we're watching a movie. We're not like we don't want to see like Wikipedia played out in front of us or whatever. Like mm. not that Wikipedia is the ultimate source. But yeah. you know what I mean? Like I, I think a lot about I'm Not There, the Bob Dylan biopic where. Uh, That's my favorite biopic. It is really good. And yeah. like where Kate Blanchett and Richard Gere both play Bob Dylan. And it's, yeah. like, it's like it's less about the truth of Dylan because Dylan is also a guy that has always lied about the truth of his life. Yes. And it's more about the idea of the artist. Right. Especially yeah. with musicians. This happens a lot. And I think it's a really interesting approach to it. I'm like. We're not really striving for historical accuracy. We're here to tell you a story and for you to be entertained over the course of this. And hopefully afterwards you will walk out of there with questions and think, I'm going to read up on that or I'm going to look into this more. And like, this is a thing that happens a lot of like, the truth isn't as fun as whatever they want you want to see on a screen. Like the real truth of the matter is often not super entertaining. So when I was coming in here, Rad, I wrote, I'm not there as one of the movies I want to talk about. That's a Todd Haynes picture. Um, I really love that movie. But- in the premise of the movie, in the very structure of the movie, you get different people playing Bob Dylan, right? Like Kate mm-hmm. Blanchett comes in, you know, Christian Bale comes out. You know, like there, there, there's these sort of rotations on different versions of Bob Dylan. And in the very structure, he's communicating to me like, we don't know if this is the truth. This is just like these characters embodying this version of Bob Dylan, which is to say the movie is in conversation with the mythology. I think mm-hmm. sometimes what I'm frustrated by is a biopic that is not at all interested in engaging with the mythology – and kind of just being like, this is – my dad was great and we're going to make a movie about him and he isn't he wonderful? And so when I see the Bob Marley movie, I, that, that to me is an example of that kind of failure. The family can be you know, very heavily involved in the making of that movie. What, do you, what are the pros and the cons of having the family so heavily involved in making a movie, do you think? Well, I mean like – that, that's the thing. It's such a con, like, because I don't think there's a right answer when in terms of having them involved and stuff, right? Yeah. And look, and I, I will go right back to the Ali example where, look, they were involved. I don't know that they necessarily had any shape, you know, in, or influence on how Michael Mann was going to tell that story. They were just sure. like, yeah, cool. Like, we might correct you on some details. And look, you have a near perfect movie as a result of that, right? And, you know, like, I mean, I think I'm thinking of like even like a, a movie like Straight Out of Compton where you see both the pros and the cons in that example, right? Because right. when you look at straight out of Compton, the NWA biopic, like you're seeing a movie where, you know, you had the, you had the input from Dr. Dre and Ice Cube. Ice Cube's you had the son detail. plays Ice Cube. Ice I mean, like, there's, <laughs> it doesn't get closer than that, right? Exactly. Yeah. And then even the director, F. Gary Gray, like he was there. He was yeah. part of like, yo, he was, he's a cameraman during the Yo! MTV raps during the yeah. NWA death row days. Like, so he, he was able to capture that Crenshaw Boulevard vibe and energy energy in that movie and he had of course access to the talent to the deets to the music to the soundtrack i mean yes. you, you can't have this nwa so got straight out of compton movie without that soundtrack right so yeah. there's the pros but then the cons is we never address the d barnes situation or any never. of the other women that dr dre hurt right yeah. so you then have you know yeah. because now this is an authorized bio but you're not you're not you're not dealing with you you're, you're giving a more sanctified image of these guys as kind of like like hip-hop folk heroes yeah um so those are the kind of agendas you have to deal with and this upcoming you know jackson michael jackson biopic that's that, on the way that that's, comes out like, next year yeah that's yeah. So that's one that you know now you you consider how these agendas come into play. Like that's one to consider because it's like, okay, like so the Michael Jackson estate approved this this biopic. Michael's nephew plays Michael. Michael's yeah. Michael's nephew yeah. Is, is playing Michael. Yeah. Michael's family is involved. Yes. Uh, Anton Fuqua's directing, and if anyone saw Emancipation, you know he doesn't give a shit. Give a deal here about <laughs> historical accuracy. <laughs> I mean, you know, like the writer. The writer of um uh, uh of, of Gladiator <laughs> Ridley by the way Sir Ridley Scott and, and fictionalizing history the writer of Gladiators involved the yeah. producer of Bohemian Rhapsody and if you saw Bohemian Rhapsody that Yeesh. was just like the Queen's surviving band members version sure. which kind of sort of subtly yeah. vilified Freddie Mercury's like kind of hom- homosexuality so you have all these people who aren't necessarily holding up for truth making a movie on behalf of the Jackson estate an yeah. estate that has worked hard to silence the victims who allege Michael Jackson sexually abused them, the child abuse uh, allegations against Michael Jackson. So is this movie, can any of these people push back and and address that? Can it address the abuse that Michael Jackson suffered as a child at the hands of his dad? Can it address any of those things? They they promise that this movie will. I don't know whether to take them with their word for this. You know, but like one of the things that they said is like, yeah, yeah, we'll get into even that, you know, the darker stuff. But the thing that you just said that I want to zero in on is the idea of the estate. The idea of the Mm -hmm. estate control something because Bill Gates that is kind of crucial to trying to make a movie about a public figure is like a lot in a lot of cases not all cases but a lot of cases 
the family has some degree, has some, some degree of control over the music, over the IP, over their image. How, how does that complicate things when people are trying to make these stories and these movies, do you think, Bilga? Well, it complicates it greatly, obviously, as we've seen. I mean, the, the Bob Marley biopic you mentioned uh, is, is a perfect example of that, yeah. which is at the same time a little surprising because – the, the Marley family was also, to some extent, involved in the 2013 documentary, mm, Marley, yeah. uh, which is actually really great. And it's kind of a warts and all biography, but, you know, but yeah. not a biopic, it's a documentary. But, yeah. you know, and I don't know what happened there. I mean, maybe they, they felt that this was more important or maybe there was their involvement was was heavier with this one. You know, the, the family, like, you know, like Rad says, the, the family does not need to sort of uh, rubber stamp things. I mean, Ferrari. Let's talk about it. Let's, talk, it. let's talk about it. Is Get a into film. it. Piero Ferrari is like one of the producers of the film. He's a character in the movie. Yeah. But the film is, I mean, if anything, it makes Enzo Ferrari look probably even worse than people thought he was, you know? <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is about his extramarital affairs. Yeah. Um, so, so that doesn't need to, you know, that the, they don't need to kind of whitewash things because the family's involved. Um, and sometimes you can actually wind up with some interesting solutions. I mean, I, I keep thinking of the movie Backbeat from 1994 about the Beatles in Hamburg. They had absolutely no access to the Beatles music or anything like that. Yeah. And it's a, it's a lovely movie. It's actually almost liberating that they didn't have to worry about that sort of thing. And later on, you know, Paul McCartney saw it and I think liked it. Uh, so, you know, there, there can actually be, you can win yourself a lot of flexibility and actually find creative solutions for not having access to this sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, or the film, you know, Jimmy All Is By My Side, uh, John Ridley's film about Jimi Hendrix, which critics really didn't like at the time, but they didn't have access to most of Jimi Hendrix's music. And they found really creative, expressive ways around that. I thought mm. that was, you know, kind of a fascinating approach to it. Yeah, that's a, it, it does sound like a difficult sort of worker. Were you going to add well, something? Just Nico, thinking of like the Jimi Hendrix thing. And, yeah. you know, like there was an issue. There was always the issue with Jimi Hendrix's family not liking uh, the idea of having, because there was like the Andre 3000 playing Jimi Hendrix thing and the family yeah. didn't like that. And, you know, we're getting an Amy Winehouse biopic potentially. And Amy Winehouse's family also notoriously like is not okay with the idea of this movie. And also like with Winehouse in particular, it's like, you know, we know the public image of Amy Winehouse, you know, yes. somebody that struggled very openly with addiction, wrote about it, sang about it. So you also have to wonder like is the family concerned about how she will be portrayed within that context too right like somebody that you know lived and died tragically quite young and yeah. like and how is that part of their life going to be portrayed and maybe not having control over that i would imagine is a very anxious feeling too right of like well we're not going to know what this looks like until it's too late to turn you know to turn the tables on this and we yeah. don't really want her to be both like vilified or lionized for this thing that was a very public part of her image I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. You're listening to Commotion. This is a, the core of what I wanted to talk about, which is that the Bible can kind of end up serve end up serving as like the final word on a person, or at least the most accessible word on a person. And so you kind of walk away being like, that was that was the life that they lived. And I, I think we don't always remember because like we are all sort of I guess like media literate. We sort we consider the role of the movie. We consider the role that a storyteller is trying to you know put certain things in and leave certain things out, not everybody's going to do that. A lot of people will walk away from a movie and be like, that's the thing that just happened. And this gets complicated, particularly with two biopics that were done recently, um, Rad, we, and they're, they're, they're the Elvis movies, right? So like, mm -hmm. first of all, Baz Luhrmann made a movie, you know, uh, that's Elvis. And then also, uh, Sofia Coppola made Priscilla. And like, they, the, the, some members of Elvis's family were really not happy about Priscilla. Can you just talk a little bit about how those two biopics approach the story of Elvis so wildly differently. Yeah, I mean, they were basically like a he says, she said take yes. on Elvis, right? And, yeah. and I mean, so the Priscilla one, Sophia Coppola's story, like that is taken from Priscilla Presley's own words from her books. It's a it's a movie where you see, uh, you, you know, it's a story of, of a young child who's like barely legal, kind of tossed into the culture surrounding this dominant, oppressive, kind of abusive figure. That's how Elvis comes off in this. Yeah. And of course, because she told that story from that perspective, but first of all, it wasn't just the estate that had a problem with it. It was Elvis's daughter, Priscilla Presley's own daughter, Lisa Marie Presley. Apparently, before she passed away, she said she, she had harsh words for that movie. Yes. And of course, the estate didn't you know they because of that perspective they did not let Sofia Coppola use any Coppola sorry they didn't let her use any of 
the mu- Elvis's music. So she had to work her way around that, right? Yeah. Um, and so so that is the unauthorized version, even though it's as far as we know, it's telling it speaks the truth, right? Right. But uh, but as as Tina Fey said, authenticity is dangerous and expensive. So <laughs> that's that's where we're at. Um, She's exactly right about that. Yes, exactly. And then but then the Elvis story is an interesting one. So like Baz Luhrmann's Elvis, which came out before, big hit. Obviously now Baz Luhrmann is someone who loves to prop up mythology, and that's exactly what yeah. he was commissioned to do with the, by the Elvis is a state in a way. He got the music. He made this big, you know, bedazzled uh, biopic on Elvis that not uh, n- props up to the mythology to the extent where this is where I had a problem with the movie. It even made Elvis, you know, it was an apology. It, it, it kind of dismissed the accusations of cultural appropriation hmm. when it came to Elvis. It it actually off put put off. It, it um transferred a lot of Elvis's flaws onto the manager character, and yeah. it tried to paint Elvis as a bleeding heart for civil rights, which we had no indication he ever was. Um, and and because he made it, you know, in line with what the estate wanted to put out there, he got all the access to the music. He could make a rock and roll movie. But I will say, like, I wouldn't consider that a compromised vision because I feel like that is the vision Baz Luhrmann set out to make. That's Baz right? Luhrmann like, behavior. Baz, Baz Luhrmann will. is yeah. not here to criticize Elvis. Baz Luhrmann's like, oh, you want me to prop up this guy's mythology? Yeah. Show me the rhinestones. The and Moulin Rouge and guy go. is not going to yeah, be like, the you know precise historian dude. But 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 to that extent though, Bill Bill Gutt, like there's something about uh, this moment, right? But the, Elvis as a site for this, out of actually out of all musicians, Elvis becoming a site for this debate um, over. You know which version of history do we get to tell? What do you make of the the supremacy of the biopic? Because we rarely get two different biopics sort of trying to get at the same thing. Yeah, and also just to add, Elvis is kind of like Napoleon in that sense. There will be more Elvis movies, so an Elvis movie <laughs> never sure ends will. up being the final word. Yeah. Um, well, the supremacy of the biopic. I mean, and you can see it. I mean, let's you know the film we haven't mentioned, Oppenheimer biopic, yes. does all the things where you know got butts and seats, very entertaining, also incredibly accurate yeah. somehow. Um, but um, I liked his thing- earlier stuff, not not so much of these later music, you know. But anyway, sorry, continue. Yes, no, no but the, one of the one of the reasons why I think the biopic has become so kind of entrenched in Hollywood is that it's it's really its own f- form of IP. Right. I mean, biopics, hmm. you know, they're, they're familiar. They have some sort of familiar beats. We kind of know what we're getting. It's like it's like a superhero movie for, you know, the the the, the pointy head literate. <laughs> like you know, like it's our superhero <laughs> movies. Right. Yeah. It's our MCU. We've got the yeah. Oppenheimer. The, we've got Elvis. The Marvel got of the intellectual. You know, yeah. yeah. Bob Marley. You know, um, I mean, it, but it is kind of because it has sort of a template, even when they riff on the template, even even biopics that sort of don't do the things that we expect them to. There is still kind of a template in our heads and even and when we watch them we judge them based on whether they're hitting the template or not so it's kind of the same thing it's like it's like it's like superhero movies or or like star wars movies like there's certain elements we expect um and i think that's why biopics in an in an era when originality is sorely lacking in the hollywood and film industry in general biopics are kind of a way to sort of get around that while making something that's not you know obviously a superhero movie i think that's why Nico, what about you? How do you think about the supremacy of the biopic right now? I mean, we're getting four Beatles movies. We're getting, <laughs> we're getting the Beatles cinematic universe. We're getting a Ringo movie, baby. And I feel Let's like go. this yeah. like obsession with the reality of people or like the story of people is yeah. only getting like... It is becoming a very interesting thing because I think we have bled a lot of other ideas dry. So we're like, well, what if we what if we move these ideas that have sort of been taking all these other IPs? What if we move that into the biopic yeah. genre? So it'll be interesting to see where this goes from here. Yeah, I don't know who asked for four Beatles movies, but you know what? It was me. It I was did. you. Yeah, you I ordered sent a letter, this. and and it was surprising to see it actually happen. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, we I, one last question before I let you all go. I've noticed a bit of a discrepancy among us here, all four of us. <laughs> biopic or biopic? I don't know yeah. what what I thought it was. Biopic my entire life. Rad. Are you caping for it's, biopic? But it is. But it is absolutely biopic. Every time you guys say biopic, you sound like you're you're introducing an invention at the World Fair. I don't say biopic. <laughs> I say biopic. Like I don't know. Bi- do you say biography or or biography? Bilga, where are you at on this, man? Help me out. <laughs> it's biopic. Thank it started, you. It started <laughs> as an academic term, and it originally it was bio slash pick. And, oh, and it was used in like- We love a know, historian in our theory, <laughs> papers, and things like that. And then eventually the trades took, you know, took hold of it. And places like Variety started just using it as one word. It's, I, gonna, for I'm totally fine picture. with both pronunciations. Thank but, you. But I- uh, 
I can't wait to read Bilga's biography <laughs> on Michael Mann. We are going to leave it there. Bilga, Rad, Nico, thank you for your time. You guys are the best. Thank this, you. Is, this has been great. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bilga is a film critic for Vulture. Rad Time and Play is a free- freelance film critic whose work shows up at the Globe and Mail and CTV. And right here on Commotion, Nico Stratus is a culture critic who writes the newsletter Anxiety Shark. My name is Alamine. I'm going to be back tomorrow. I will see you then. Thank you.